hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the Wilderness Issues Lecture Series. This year focused on conservation and climate change. My name is Nikki Fear, and I am the coordinator of UM's Climate Change Studies Program. I'm one of the series coordinators along with Lori Young, who is the director of the Wilderness Institute. We want to thank the Cinnabar Foundation for their, donate, their generous grant to help us put on this series, as well as um, Rick and Susie Gretz, who are letting us use their photography for our series poster and our weekly flyers. We, um, tonight, are going to have a lecture from Dr. Joel Brown, I'm sorry, Joel Berger, um, titled Ice, he didn't hear that, Ice, Wildlife, and Us, What Legacies, What Lessons, and we really hope you come back next week. Um, Sarah Bates, who's in the audience, just right there, is going to be, raise your hand, <laughs> giving um, a lecture about warm, water in a warming west policy options to respond to climate change impacts. Really important topic. She is a, the senior fellow at the UM Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy. She's on the board of the Clark Fork Coalition and a member of the Carpe Diem West. So now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, Joel Berger is a professor here at the University of Montana. He is the John J. Craighead Chair and UM Professor of Wildlife Conservation. He's also a, a project director with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, as a wildlife biologist, he has studied wildlife all over the world, from the highlands of Central Asia to the deserts of Africa, way up north in the Arctic. Um, and he has studied a great many of different animals. Um, he has uh, his, his great interest, though, is in, in blending science with on-the-ground conservation, and so his research focuses on the conservation of species and intact ecosystems. Um, just one tidbit about Joel. You know, a lot of you in your wallets, if you open them up, will have pictures of family and loved ones. Well, if you ask Joel to open up his wallet and take out some pictures, you see pictures of many different animals, exotic animals, and I had to ask him what many of these animals are, and they include um, wild yak in Tibet, which he has studied, muck, musk oxen in the Arctic, where he studied the impacts of climate change, and also saiga antelope in Mongolia, where he's worked on their conservation. There were also photos of blue sheep and takin and cayenne from, I'm not sure exactly where, I'm sure we'll see some photographs. And I know he has also studied black rhinos and elephants in Namibia, wolves, bison, coyotes closer to home here in the northern Rockies. So how did he get there? For all of you who want to be wildlife biologists, he got his doctorate from the University of Colorado in Boulder in biology. He went from there to work for the Smithsonian for seven years and then was a full tenured professor at the University of Nevada in Reno for 16 years. He's written five books on... Um, Topics from wild horses, rhinos, bison, and fear and prey species, including one titled, The Better to Eat You With. He's an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he... No, no, come on, come on, come on. No, he didn't want me to go on. This, I have two lines left. But this is the best part. Are you guys bored? No, okay. And he's a recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award for the Society for Conservation Biology. And um, a part of that was working on the protection of a really important migratory corridor in the National Forest of Wyoming, 45 miles wide and one mile long, which is um, s s the longest migratory corridor for, in the contiguous 48. So I will pass it over. I said too much, but it's a great um, intro, I think, for Joel Berger. Please join me in welcoming him. do carry a picture of my daughter as well. <laughs> Let's see. You can, you, you can hear me. OK, fine. Um, Nikki, thanks. Pleasure to be here. I could tell stories about you, but I will not because you have students here. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, let's see. Can we turn the lights down a little bit more, please? What I'm going to talk about today, ice, wildlife, us. I know you can read 
this is the last time I will be reading what's on the screen to you. Um, the diversity of life on this planet is absolutely stunning. We know from spoon-billed sandpipers to cranes to butterflies, we have migrations that are in the hundreds of miles to thousands of miles. We have species that live on ice. We have species that live in sand under sand. We also know that this planet is in trouble. Jerry Brown, who has been mayor of Oakland, has run for president, said during a presidential campaign 15 years ago, this planet is sinking and we need to do things. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I want to do that within the context of looking at some of the challenges that are apparent. We know that we have economic issues. We know that we have climate issues. We know that we have issues that deal with human demography and resource limitations. What I want to do, though, is to talk about climate and to think about wildlife and think about biodiversity. And so when we think about some of the challenges that are ahead, we know that different kinds of species are sometimes looked at as the poster children or poster child. And so snow-dependent species are the ones that oftentimes come to mind, at least those featured mostly in the media, but also by scientists, also by a variety of other people involved with trying to maintain what we have um, on this planet. So wolverines come to mind, but there are other icons as well. Snow leopards, high elevation dweller in the mountains of Central Asia is another one that often is touted. White-tailed jackrabbits, snowshoe hares, species that change their color to avoid predators, but when they get out of sync, they may also be in trouble. But beyond animals, other types of icons exist. For instance, when we think about climate change, sea ice recession is a big deal. Species that rely on ice flows are a big deal. People that rely on these species are also a cause for concern and have been held up. And we know whether we think about Katrina or other disasters, if we had something like this in New York City, we would really get the attention of a lot of people. So I'm going to do three things today. Thematically, I will touch on climate, but focus more on snow, ice, and cold environments. I'll also talk about biodiversity. And then finally, I'm going to wrap conservation around both of these. So I want to start somewhat with a bit of a preamble and to ask what it is that we do and wh where it is that we're going. And maybe the best way to think about this is to ask you in the audience to put yourself in shoes that maybe you've already been in. The question is this. What is amongst the worst things you can think of that you've done when you were young and you would like to take back? I mean, really, think about it. It's like, okay, what kind of things did I do that might have hurt somebody? And so, for instance, we can think of snowballs. And we can be a little bit devilish. And you may know what's coming. Have you ever been eight years old and done that? and had this happen. <laughs> Have you ever been in a movie theater or a classroom and yelled fire and wondered 20 years later, what about the person who broke that leg? I shouldn't have done that. Have you ever wondered what a hay bale is like if it burns and the garage catches on fire? And you think about that after the fact, and it's just like, I shouldn't have done that. Well, this is a bit what we're facing, because we're starting trouble. But the examples I gave, we can self-correct. But when you think about the burden of climate, this is something that we've started. And it may be 100 years. It may be 200 years before we can get back to a level where we would like to be. So I want to start with ice. And to think about the polar ice caps, but in the northern hemisphere, Greenland holds most of the ice. We have a lot of glaciers, not only in Greenland, but across a variety of different systems, both in the south and in the north. When we start to think about 
some of the changes. Let's see. Okay. So uh, Greenland, Greenland's here, Svalbard, the island, the other island is there. If we look at some of the changes that have occurred over time and look at the projections, this is where we're going to be somewhere like this. We don't know exactly where we're going to be 50 more years from now, but we know we're going to have lost a heck of a lot. And this can have profound impacts, not only on the physical environment, not only on marine scapes, not only on landscapes, but certainly the biological systems that we know today. I want to move further south. And so instead of staying at the top of the world, shown here in blue are the world's glaciers, the montane glaciers. And if we start to think about changes in glaciers in the last 30 or 40 years, and we use some of the databases that are available, and so in red there, and I'm colorblind, so I'm going to have a hard time with some of these colors um, and looking back, but in red are the databases. And if we think about those and look at the changes over time, whether we're looking at the annual thickness changes on a year-to-year -year basis or if we're looking at the cumulative change over time, we know we're losing a lot of ice. And as a consequence, we are changing a lot of the hydrological regimes that occur in these systems. And these will have impacts not only on people, but on a wide variety of other species besides us that have depended on systems. And we can also look at proof positive because we know fashion is something that's very pragmatic and we know that you know, nobody worries about things. It's just you know, all about cold, so here we know it's warming. <laughs> okay, ice. Let's take a more serious look at ice. These are polar bears. I think everybody knows these are polar bears. Excuse me. Um, this is uh, the northern tip of the US. This is Barrow, Alaska. Everything above it is sea ice. The colored dots there, each different color reflects a polar bear that had a radio collar on it. And so when we see multiple points of the same color, those are the movements of a polar bear. So we have a variety of different polar bears. Notice that this is March. These data are from March 2010, by the way. What happens in the summer, the sea ice recesses, it moves north because the oceans around here warm and so the ice melts. Polar bears like ice. When we get back to October, polar bears follow the ice pack and then ultimately end up some polar bears, not all around this area. And polar bears have a circumpolar distribution, so they're across the north in all the northern countries. Polar bears need ice. They need ice for refuge. They need ice for hunting seals. And despite their thick under fur, which protects them against cold water, and despite their very thick layers of fat, polar bears can get cold. They do meta metabolize more calories when they're swimming for a long time or in cold water. And so ice is a good thing for polar bears for a variety of reasons. If we think about the cycle and warming and how this impacts polar bears, there are a couple of points that I want to make. As temperatures warm, sea ice melts. As the sea ice melts, the sunlight, the solar radiation, rather than reflecting back up, is absorbed by the darker ocean, which then enhances or exacerbates the warming. So we get involved in a vicious cycle. Two weeks ago, this was in the Calgary paper, a polar bear swam for nine days. It couldn't find ice. It swam and it swam. And this was based on a paper that was published earlier this year. And we had a 650 kilometer swim. So that's about 400 miles of swimming. The animal lost more than 20% of its body mass over a six week period because biologists don't catch polar bears regularly, which is a good thing. But so between some captures, we know that it lost a lot of its mass. Of 27 polar bears that were collared that survived long swims, this was the longest swim that we have of a polar bear that survived. We've lost a lot of polar bears. What was really sad about this story is that the animal's yearling didn't have enough reserves and disappeared. 
and yearlings live with polar bears, they stay dependent young for up to three years. And so it was presumed drowned. It just ran out of energy. Ice is needed not only by polar bears, but a lot of species. These are walruses that have pitched up over on the Chukotka Peninsula, just across on the Russian side. Walruses have also been pitching up on the northwest coast of Alaska in numbers that hadn't been ever recorded in the past. And in these large concentrated aggregations on land, as opposed to sea ice, a lot of trampling occurs. And one such event resulted in the trampling of 30 um, young polar bear, um, uh, sorry, uh, young walrus. We don't know much about the interactions between polar bears and walruses. We don't know to what extent, because they're both being squeezed, that this may have some unusual impacts on their dynamics. Maybe it'll have none. We just don't have very good information. What we do know is that in the summer, polar bears are being stranded on, co in coastal, on coastal Alaska. We don't know if the frequency of this is changing because programs to monitor this have just started about five years ago. What we do know is that polar bears on land can be very dangerous. And a colleague of mine, Steve Zack, who works for the Wildlife Conservation Society, he had a field camp where he was studying birds and interested in climate change. And they had to evacuate. And it cost about $30,000. It was the end of their field season. But they felt that you know, it's not their land. It's their land. There are interactions that occur between polar bears and another species. This is a grizzly bear. And when grizzly bears and polar bears meet, they usually don't mate. But in this particular case, they did. And there have been several other cases, at least two cases, of polar bear, grizzly bear hybrids. And let's see. This is um, how we've detected that is um, legal hunts, two different hunters pulled in bears that, that were subsequently tested um, by DNA, and they were real hybrids, and this is one of the stuff, stuffed ones. So when we think about the future for polar bears, it's not especially promising. With sea ice receding, polar bears have a, tr have a difficult time, and given the rate of loss of ice, their ability and their genetic potential to adapt in time is not very promising. And so I started this section talking about poster child, poster children, and clearly the poster children of climate change is this species. But before I move on, I want to say a couple more words about ice. Ice connects, ice divides. Ice is what unites us with parts of Asia. And if we go back 18,000 years, look at Alaska. Can everybody find Alaska? I assume so. I hope so. Um, Alaska is not part of the US. It was part of Asia. But as the ice sheets melted, we've had colonization moving in both directions. Mammals for hundreds of thousands of years this mammal most recently in the last 13,000 years. I want to move away from ice, but still stay at the top of the world for a little bit and talk about biodiversity. Notice these lakes. At one time, they were ice covered. Before that, they were covered with some glacial ice. As we've lost ice, we've created habitat. Birds from every continent come to northern Alaska to breed, to mate. And there's some spectacular diversity across a variety of taxa. There are at least a dozen species of marine mammals that use these waters. There are other mammals. Um, two of these are unique to the Arctic, polar bears and Arctic foxes wolves, grizzly bears, but they have much broader distributions. Ptarmigan, there are some moose that live in the Arctic. 
These are little fat reindeer, wild reindeer. They're about this big, they're wild, on Svalbard, that island I showed you earlier. They've been there for about 10,000 years. They have no predators, so they've developed gobs of fat. They're smaller than pronghorn antelope, and they're making it in the cold. And then there are musk oxen. There are spectacles in the Arctic, migrations by land mammals as well as by birds, and some butterflies. What I want to do is to ask to what extent periglacial species may be challenged by warming. And when I say periglacial, I'm talking about species that live in the shadow of glaciers or rely on glacial refuge. I'm thinking about cold adapted species. We hear regularly that we're running out of space. If we move up, we hit some point and there, we can't go any higher. If we go to the top of the world or the bottom, we can't go any further. And so our cold adapted species is going to be toast. So let's think about that and I'm going to focus on some groups of species that rely on periglacial regions, or at least that's the expectation that are cold adapted. And I'm going to start first by showing you where glaciers are in western North America. And what I'm going to do is to pose a question, and the question is this. When we look at the distribution of changing March minimum temperatures, so basically when we're getting into the spring, and when we ask where have changes occurred with warming across the western U.S. over this 55-year period, whether that has an impact on some of the species that rely on these areas. And we lost all the colors, except for blues. Okay, so blues are where we have temperatures that are decreasing. The blacks are supposed to be reds, but you remember I told you I have a problem with red, so we're just gonna pretend that the blacks are reds. All the blacks are areas where we have warming temperatures over that 55-year period. The bigger circles show proportionately more warming. And so I'll draw your attention to where we live. Look at the Rockies. We've got the most warming occurring in these areas. And so let's ask about a species that is widely distributed that in some way has been somewhat of a poster child for warming. This, these are called pikas. Pikas are members of the rabbit family. What we know about pikas is that they've experienced changing distributions. Okay, these were maybe going to be red, but we're going to call them black. Where we've got these black dots, they've gone extinct somewhere between 10,000 years and 1,000 years ago. And we know that because of fossils. The other colors there are where pika currently occur. We've seen range changes in pikas. If you've been to Las Vegas, if you've been to the Great Basin Desert, we've been losing pikas out of there for 10,000 years. That area has warmed up. In fact, instead of thinking about 10,000 years or 1,000 years, we've lost 75% of the low elevation pikas in Nevada in the last 80 years. We know temperatures are changing, not just in Nevada, but as I just indicated, across the Rockies. And so if we ask, are pikas likely to make it? I'm going to toss out an anomaly for you. Is any, have people here driven to Portland through the um, Columbia Gorge? Raise your hand if you have. OK, maybe 25%, so that's good. Um, if you've done it in the summer, you know that the Columbia River Gorge gets bloody hot. Well, there are pikas in the Columbia River Gorge. And they live in these t uh, lava tubules, and they live in caves. And what's interesting about pikas is if we think about the normal distribution of elevation of pikas, so here this is in meters, but this is about 5,000 feet. Pikas go from 5,000 feet up to almost 11,000 feet. Pikas don't like temperatures. This is in centigrade, 22 centigrade. It's about 72 Fahrenheit. 
they become, uh, they have a very difficult time thermoregulating above 72 degrees. So let's put this in perspective. Where are the Columbia River, uh, Columbia Gorge pikas? They're a full 3,000 feet, 300 meters, 3,000 feet lower than where normal pikas occur. In that area, as I said, temperatures can get to 96 degrees. Pikas are there. So it's not clear what to expect. We know that pikas go from still places in Nevada all the way up to Alaska into the Yukon. They have a wide geographical range. Their thermal tolerances may be very limited or they may not. We don't have a real good sense as to whether they will become toast. What we can say or what we can, I guess, pose is that species that occur at lower elevations that are cold adapted or species that are at lower latitudes may have some issues. And so let's look at this and instead of thinking pikas, let's think mountain goats. Fossil occurrences, current goats, we can see that over the last 10,000 years as Climate has induced vegetation changes, warming temperatures inducing vegetation changes. Goat range has receded northward. So what we can do is to ask whether or not there's some positive benefits. And so instead of thinking lower latitude, we're going to go to high latitude. We're going to go up to southeastern Alaska, and we're going to take a look at goats. This is Icy Bay, and the Tyndall Glacier has receded about 15 miles in the last uh, 50 years. And when we look at what's going on schematically, we can see areas of exposed habitat where the glaciers have dissipated. And if one flies in, we can start looking at those hills where glacial ice was thick enough and we wouldn't see most of those hills. And as we get closer, we can start to look and what we might see are white dots which turn out to be goats. So the bottom line here is that where we have snow and ice that is being lost, we're creating some habitat. And that habitat has been colonized by goats within 40 years. I'm going to move from the top of the world further south. We're going to go over to Central Asia. This is the Tibetan Plateau. So we've got, let's see if this works. Uh, we've got uh, the Indian subcontinent is here. We've got Bhutan and Nepal. We've got, uh, we've got Bhutan and Nepal. Tibetan Plateau above, that's the Himalayan range that's looking at you. The plateau varies from about 14,000 to over 22,000 feet. Rich Harris is here and Drew Gay are here. They're both biologists and they work on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, some of the interesting things about the Tibetan Plateau is that we're also watching the same kind of fracturing of glaciers and glacial melt. And I should point out, Sarah Halverson is here and she also works in that area. Um, and we're seeing pollution because of the burning of fossil fuels to the south and that's causing some problems. And then we're also seeing temperature changes. And we know that this is going to impact people greatly. And we know that what happens to animals sooner or later also happens to people because we all share the same environment. What we don't know, among the many things that we don't know, are how endemic wildlife, endemic meaning restricted or occurring exclusively in that area, we don't know anything about the thermal abilities of wild yak, but given that their range is restricted to high altitude, we assume that there's some kind of relationship with temperature. Cheru, which was the mascot for the uh, Olympics in 2008 in Beijing, and Tibetan fox. We don't really know how they're going to do. But let's pick another species, another one that you may know a little bit more about, snow leopards. Snow leopards have a wide range. They've also been regularly featured, not only in BBC, but other documentaries. They occur up to 17,500 feet. 
they also occur down to 3,500 feet in the Gobi Desert, where they're exposed to temperatures that can be up to 90 degrees. So they at least are occurring in areas where we know they're exposed to a wide variety of conditions. They're also hard to see. Can you find the snow leopard in there? I had to circle it because I can't find it. There it is. Two eyes, ears, nose. We'll do that again. OK, so let me try to sum up where we're at so far. There's a great deal of uncertainty for many species. These deal with their ability to tolerate abiotic changes, changes that are meteorological, changes in the physical environment, not the biological environment. These are raccoon dogs. They're not raccoons. They're not dogs. They're raccoon dogs. They show great flexibility. On the islands of Japan, several of the other islands, including Sakhalin in Russia, they don't hibernate. When they get over to the Russian mainland, they hibernate. They show some flexibility, just like our black bears do. They're black bear populations in North America that don't hibernate. So there is some incumbent flexibility in some species. We don't know that much about levels of adaptability. We do know that ice-dependent species are going to have lots of problems. We don't know as much about some of the other species. And, and, we know very little about species interactions. And that's an important point, because we're just talking about physical drivers. But when we start talking about the biology, species that live in communities, interactions seem to matter. So what I've done so far, talk about ice, talked about biodiversity. We're not finished with biodiversity yet. We're going to do a case study. We're going to do a case study up at the tip of the continent, the American part of the tip of the continent, in case any Canadians are here. Sorry. We're going to focus on the quintessential Arctic land mammal. Musk oxen are restricted to the Arctic. They also occur uh, the Canadian Arctic, Greenland, and America. Um, they have thick fur. They have three to four inches of body fat. Why would we expect climate change to affect the persistence of musk ox or any of the other temperature sensitive species that I talked about? Well, one reason is they may have problems dealing with thermoregulation and heat. We also know that habitats are changing. In the Arctic, there is more woody vegetation. The tree line is expanding northward. And so habitats change. And then that thing about species interactions. So let me give you the conservation context. In Arctic Alaska, there are three musk oxen populations and then some fragmented subpopulations. Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Population in Arctic Refuge was doing very well up until about 2000, the year 2000, still had over 300 animals. This is where it's at today. There are 10 to 20 animals in the 77,000 square kilometer refuge. It's an area two and a half times the size of Serengeti. They're functionally extinct in the refuge. Persistence has been compromised. There might be, there are a variety of drivers. So let's consider, but we're not going to consider that for Arctic Refuge. Instead, what we're going to do is focus on populations to the west. And we're going to ask, what's driving the dynamics of musk oxen? And I'm not going to get into a detailed biological study or scientific study. What I want to do is to frame some issues about the ways biologists target either ecosystems, species, specific questions. And I'll run through the logical basis. I'm not going to plow data at you. Just give you a sense of what we're learning about this system. So we've capitalized on areas that have different populations, and the populations vary in their growth rates. 
And so we can call this area B for Bering Land Bridge. The area above, we're going to call it Cape Cruz and Stern. Um, this is Russia over here. Uh, in contrast to um, what Sarah Palin says, that she could see Russia, she's never been there. She's lived a thousand miles to the south. <laughs> Our two study populations. Uh, Bering Land Bridge population is doing great, exponential growth. Cape Cruz and Stern population was growing, it stabilized, it may be declining, there's some variation. It's certainly not growing similarly. So, what might be causing these differences? Well, there's some relationship amongst each of these, but if we try to set them apart, we could talk about disease, which we're not. We could talk about nutrition, we could talk about climate drivers, we can talk about species interactions. And so I'm going to work you through the logic on how each of these might be important and tell you what we're learning. Before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of background on what this species is. So the context. Muskox are well known as one of the few mammal species that live in groups that form defensive formations. Elephants also do this. Um, babies in the middle. This is what it looks like um, from kind of a ground air type level when they form these. Um, musk oxen, closest relative in North America, are not bison. They are mountain goats. And so musk ox, closest genetic relative. Um, and they're not that close, but they're part of the uh, goat and sheep family. If nutrition is causing these differences between the two populations, what we would expect is that the two populations will differ average body masses, adult survival, juvenile survival. I said I wasn't going to read, so conception rate, sexual uh, maturity, uh, lean or not lean condition, and their teeth. Okay, how do we go about getting information? Well, we bring in the Blackhawks and we um, immobilize animals, we capture animals, we put on radio collars so we can follow animals, but so we can also then estimate their survivorship. Um, and we put tags on them um, so we can tell who's who as well. We also weigh animals, and this is uh, Lane Adams, who's a, a colleague of mine um, and a co-partner in this project. So we get body weights on animals. We also do ultrasound so we can look at body fat on animals. And we check out their teeth. We also collect poops in the field, that scientific word. And the reason we pick up the poops is so we can evaluate pregnancy and hormones, um, looking, uh, it's running through the, a series of laboratory analyses. And then we find animals in the field. And so biologists on the left, clump group of muskox there and one of the sunny days. And we find animals on the ground. And this is Scott Bergen on your right, who's a landscape ecologist from the Wildlife Conservation Society, and Jimmy Wayawana from the village of Shishmarav. And Scott is teaching Jimmy how to use a GPS unit to find where we had the last recorded muskox. And Jimmy looked over at me as Scott was kind of playing and trying to figure it out. And he says, Joel, I think they're over the hill. And Scott's playing for another five minutes and converting lat longs to UTMs and then had wrong declination. And he finally got it figured out after six minutes. And Scott says, hey, Jimmy, I think they're over the hill. And Jimmy goes, yeah, I love technology. So, OK. Um, all right, so what are the key sources of variation between our two populations? Teeth. OK, these are the ones from study site B, Bering Land Bridge, the population that's doing well. These are good teeth in contrast to those from Krusenstern. Um, when Jimmy saw these pictures, he said, the people from Shishmaraf drink too much Coca-Cola. Our teeth look like those of muskox. So he was recognizing, obviously, some problems in their, within their society in terms of dentition. But we certainly did not expect this in our other study area. So there's your contrast. So if we go back to our nutritional hypothesis, these are the things that we expect to differ. Well, what do we know that differs? We can rearrange these. All these that are 
on your right that say similar, that means that they're not differing between our two populations. Each of those four parameters are associated with body mass. And the reason it says inconsistent, because in some years, animals from area A are 10% bigger. In other years, animals from area B are 10% bigger. So it's inconsistent. Differences in juvenile survival in teeth. So when we think about this, what we can say is that, you know, we're not sure, but the evidence is certainly not pointing to nutrition. So what about climate? If climate's affecting these two areas differently, the word we would use is spatial heterogeneity, we can make some predictions about how weather might be shaping these conditions. And one of the things that we look at then is snow levels. And so we've been doing this at three different months. And let me point out again, remember, we're comparing our two populations in these two regions. And at this point, we're still working through analyses. And so we don't have a, a, a precise answer. But we're leaning away at this point from variation in snow being a driver. What about other parameters? What about if we could use remote sensing to look at some index of vegetation greenness between the two areas? And so that's what we've done. And we've done this, again, with Scott Bergen, the guy who is showing us the GPS unit, because he's a good techie guy. And what Scott has done is he's looked at over a 15-year period one square kilometer pixels to evaluate whether or not, so let's see, increases or the color scheme is all messed up. I could tell that much. Um, OK, well, let me think of how I want to do this then. Um, populations at the top end are stable or declining. Populations here are increasing. We could make a prediction about all the different colors that you can't see which should be characterized with which. Um, and we would predict uh, decreases. We can match out the decreases, so that's good. So we'd expect in the far, uh, on your far top right, decreases. And so what did we find? Well, so Scott did a lot of different kind of analysis, and all the colors are gone from this one, too. So we won't worry about that. But we will say this, is that we still have more analyses to do, because as scientists, you are always doing more and more analyses. Um, but currently, we can suggest that climate impacts are ambiguous. They're not a good signal for the differences that we're finding. So what does that leave us with? Species interactions. So what affects calf recruitment? Well, muskox, when they have opportunities to give birth on the tops of hills, they often seize them. So what's down here? Oh, we'll take another look. What's down there? It's a pod of bears, Sterling. And I'm going to show you a video that I hope is going to work. OK, I want to show this video, so we're going to wait a second. We're going to wait more than a second. Um, did she disappear? Bummer. OK, uh, no, we have the, uh, the superstar is coming. OK, good, thanks. So we're going to show a video. This was shot on the Hall Road. So the Hall Road is the area. Um, it's a dirt road. It's the only real dirt road in Arctic Alaska. And so th um, I'm not going to narrate for you. I'm just going to set the stage. Hall Road takes uh, people up to Prudhoe Bay and back. So. Oh, there's a little sound. You'll like the sound. That's it for the sound. We're done for sound. Oh. 
okay, um, maybe a little bit gruesome. Um, there are many people I know in this room that also like bears. And if I had baby bears and showed, we'd all be saying, how cute. Animals have to eat. Nature is cruel. Um, what role do bears play in terms of species interaction with muskox? Bears kill adults. There were more than 30 cases reported by Pat Reynolds in Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is a grizzly bear, obviously a grizzly bear. This is a different grizzly bear. They're both on top of a dead musk oxen. Um, this is a non-intact radio collar. This musk oxen did not die a peaceful death. We've collared 71 animals. We've had 18 mortalities so far. We can't say for certain, but we can say with a good deal of, likely, of likelihood that bears were responsible for most. There are not site differences between our two study areas in terms of the frequency of predation. There are differences in the survival of juveniles between our sites, but we are not marking juveniles, and so we don't know why they're disappearing more at one site than another. So, to conclude this section, let me say that we've been looking at a variety of factors that might be associated with the differences between our populations. At this point, and this is early on in our project, we're into our starting our fifth year, long-term data sets are a luxury and only in one major area do we, well actually two, do we have long-term data sets on polar bears, which is why we're much further ahead understanding the ice connection. For my purposes, it looks as if nutrition and climate at this point are not major factors, but they could be because our study is short. Species interactions may be more important. Okay, so I've talked about ice, I've talked about biodiversity. Let me try to wrap this around conservation. What I'm going to do is tell you what we can do and what we can't do. So let me start with, perhaps frustratingly, but things that I don't think that we can control. Forest expansion. I don't think we have much control. Rain on snow events, also calls, cause, called icing, which happens here in Montana, which happens in a lot of areas, but it may be happening more frequently. And what it does is it precludes species like caribou or musk oxen, where up to 20,000 died in the high Canadian Arctic in 2003 because of a rain on snow event. Ice recession. Only two years ago did we see the opening of the Northwest Passage. And we're going to see more. We're going to see Arctic shipping lanes. The first tourist boats started, uh, the first Boats bringing tourists to Barrow started last year. We're going to see exotic species that come with shipping lanes. We can't control lifestyles in China. But that's not fair because we have a hard time controlling lifestyles in the US as well. What can we control? Well, we can think about land use planning under climate scenarios. I'm going to make a point, and it's going to seem anomalous at first. So you need to bear with me. These are penguins. Yes, they're not polar bears. Penguins live in the south. Joel knows that. Polar bears live in the north. There's a point coming. Penguins can move, or they can stay. It depends on what's happening in their backyard. They can stay or they can move. They can die or they can adapt. We know that they're not going to adapt to conditions like this. Thinking about movements and thinking about parks, these are wild yak from the Tibetan Plateau. Wild yak move just like almost all large mammals move. So let's consider a scenario where we have a protected area. We have summer range wholly uh, within it. Glacier National Park, Yellowstone, you can pick places. It doesn't have to be a national park, any kind. It could be national forest, it could be BLM land. Winter ranges, some of which are maybe more protected than others. 
as we have warming, we may see a shift in either summer ranges or win uh, summer or winter ranges and a change in migration routes. Summer ranges may fall outside. And what we may then see, because of animals' needs to access resources, conflicts. And we certainly see this already at a small scale, although it's a large scale for the bison that get killed, but we certainly see some of these issues. So, what is it that we can control? <coughs> what kind of decisions do managers have to make? And for whom do they make them? And what is our role in shaping those kind of decisions? Well, we can control how landscapes are figured, or we should. If we have fences, we can talk about permeability. We can talk about connectivity. The picture on your right is Yellowstone on your far right, and this hard boundary here is Targhee National Forest. We have choices. We can make decisions. We can control how some of these are made. What about roads? This is the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, Yellowstone Park, the Tetons. The next slide is going to be roads. It's going to look like spaghetti. All these black lines, all these are roads. It's these wilderness areas that are lacking. We have choices about roads. We have choices about sprawl, about fences making them wildlife friendly, about how fast we drive, whether we legislate it or not. Those are choices we all make. We can choose to be more energy efficient or not. We can ask, what are the best configurations of gas fields to allow for sage grouse, for prairie chickens, for other species? We can design protected migration routes. We can ask for them to be implemented. We can deal with food resources, fisheries management, invasive species. Those are things that are under our control, or should be. We can do more with the trafficking of illegal wildlife. And we certainly should be able to do better with traffic and urban planning. So let me do a reality check as I kind of work through the last two or three minutes of this talk. Um, reality check. So there's a sense of urgency, and I think we all feel it at one level or another. It's like, short term, what do we do? Long term, well, this might be climate. It might be an animal's evolutionary potential. We know that to conserve species, we have to maintain genetic diversity within their limited or not so limited gene pools. But how do we balance and think about long term versus short term? If we start planning for climate scenarios, which we should, we have to consider trade-offs. So I'm going to take an example with black rhinos and think about long-term and short-term threats and ask how many generations can, can we go? A rhino generation is about 10 years. And so if we think about 50 rhino generations, that's 500 years. And if we think about rhinos in places like the Namib Desert that gets two inches of rain a year and it's changing because of climate, or if we think about rhinos in other places, we need to consider, all right, where would be the best places to put rhinos if we're going to do more conservation? That's the long term. Here's the short term. In three generations, we lost 97% of all of Africa's black rhinos. And so this dissonance between long and short term is real. And it seems to me that if we lose animals from the ground, then the long term planning that we're doing is for naught. And so there are immediate things that I think it's essential that we think about. So concluding thoughts, food webs, ice. We know that the Arctic is changing, and it's going to change. And we're going to lose a lot of ice. And we're going to lose polar bears and apex carnivore. And the scavengers, Arctic foxes and glaucous gulls amongst, another, uh, amongst a whole cohort of other scavengers, we're going to lose them, and we're going to change um, food webs, both bottom up and from the top down. You know what the next replacement for polar bears are going to be? It's not us. As we lose more ice, we've already got more killer whales. 
working the northern part of the Bering, um, the northern Bering Sea, and into the Chukchi already. Some species are going to benefit from losing ice. Others are going to be more toasted. It depends on their tolerance to a variety of conditions. The examples that I gave with mountain goats might be one that would be realistic. Species that have wide thermal tolerances are going to be favored, those that occur where there's wide environmental variance. When we talk about climate change, do we talk about bison? No. Bison experience, their historic distribution was into Mexico. They were exposed to 110 degree summer temperatures, whereas in Canada exposed to minus 25. Same for pronghorn. Species that have wide ranges are not the ones that are going to have problems. Species that are very specialized, have narrow niches, that are cold dependent, those are the ones that may have problems. Species interactions may be very important. Conservationists are not clear what to do about understanding the relevance of species interactions. There are actions that we can adopt to manage lands. I went through some of those. We need to balance and to think if the goal is not just thinking about us as humans, but the environment we live in, we have to think not just long term, but short term, keeping populations connected, keeping spaces open. I don't think it's all doom and gloom. We've had some great successes. The successes come in a lot of different forms. We have black footed ferrets back where as of the 1980s, we thought that they were totally extinct in the early 80s. We've put peregrines back. Musk oxen have been reintroduced. Wolves have been reintroduced. The idea of Pleistocene rewilding, we've put bison back. Condors are back where they were also all toasted and mostly gone, except only existing in captivity. So there have been successes. We're having dialogues. Ten years ago, climate change was not part of a dialogue. My colleague Lane Adams could not talk about that. He works for the federal government. Now he can. We've got legislation that's working. Not as perfectly as we might like, but we have wetlands that are protected. We have some migration corridors that are protected. So I began talking about some of the things that we do as kids and we would like to take back. Well, climate change is something that's there and we're not going to be able to take that one back. But we can think through, we can be active, and I don't think it's biological scientists, I don't think it's climate scientists that are saving the world. I don't know who's saving the world, but I do know that social sciences have a huge role to play. And educating and you look at where we're at now versus where we were, you look at courses like this and you look at programs like what Nikki and um, others have put together. With that, I'll just say thanks. I like Missoula. I love Missoula. It's fun being here. Thank you. And I've had much help, and so I want to acknowledge all my helpers. So yeah, we have some time for questions. We can just kill that if you want. Um, I'm not sure. All right, we can just leave it. OK. Yeah, go ahead. How do you explain the? Uh, um, so the question, it's a good question. What's causing the differences in the two populations of muskox, one that have the really nasty teeth and one that um, have nice teeth? We have no clue. <laughs> we have no clue. We know that um, it's... Well, it, it, uh, it's not a genetic thing because both populations are derived from the same source. Um, and we know that the animals, um, the young animals we handle, their teeth are good. And so at some point, 
Um, there's either breakage, there may be mineral deficiency, um, we're not sure. And we've had a really hard time collecting the teeth because when the animals die, we usually can't get the teeth back. We can find part of the skulls, but getting the jaws has been really difficult for us. And so the only time we have to get the teeth to run them through a lab to we'll say, look at minerals, is when we've mobilized them. And we haven't had the heart to pull the teeth because they have so few teeth. So we haven't done that. So we've made a choice that if we can get more jaws, we'll be able to do it. But we didn't feel it was right to start pulling teeth when these animals had so few. When you talk about species interactions, are you, are you mostly focusing on species between wildlife, different species of wildlife, or the vegetation itself? Um, it could go both ways. That's a good point. So when I've been thinking about it, because I don't study plants, um, I've been more somewhat myopic thinking about interactions between species that will shape their distribution. But plants obviously have massive effects on herbivores and how they shape where they occur. And certainly changing protein, changing you know, mineral composition of plants can have massive effects on what animals are doing. And so good question. Um, yeah, good question. And, and it's appropriate to look both ways. Somebody back. There, yeah. Why do you think the, uh, the muskox stays a dark color for everything else? The foxes, the wolves, the caribou, the bears. What, 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 what kept the muskox? So why do the, why do the muskox remain dark, whereas, um, I don't know. I mean, I can, I can give you a lot of speculations. <laughs> I can give you speculations, but I don't know. I mean, wolves hunt, but we don't really know if black wolves are poorer hunters than our lighter wolves. People just haven't figured that one out. There's some evidence from Yellowstone. I don't know what it is, but people have thought about it. But in the Arctic, nobody knows. Um, doll sheep, you're right. They're white throughout. Mountain goats, white throughout. So good observation. Answers are lacking. Yes. Um, I'm an archaeologist. I've got a couple questions for you. I noticed that the, um, the, the charts you show for some of the distributions of like the pica um, date from the middle Holocene, which was a really warm period that, is, as far as we know, was not human caused. Um, I was wondering if uh, scientists like you could find useful data from that previous warming period, maybe use it as a control of some kind. And also, uh, how can archaeologists help? Um, so. The question, the, just to repeat the questions, one is that um, I showed a map of changing distributions over the last 10,000 years or so for both goats and pikas. And so one of the questions was, um, can we use uh, insights from those changing distributions to help us think about future distributions? And then the second question is, how can archaeologists help? Um, the concept of ecological baselines is hugely important. And, like our National Park Service usually stops uh, or starts at around 1492, so the pre-Columbian period. And we say, this is what we would like to put our parks back into, if we can, and recognizing that there are tons of issues that go with that. And so it's not really hard and fast. Archaeologists bring a lot of insight into telling us what kind of changes occur over time, oftentimes what the drivers are, sometimes the human interactions. But getting a baseline is really important because if we want to restore species or want to restore ecosystems, of course, the concept of a target is ours. It's a human construct. But archaeologists can bring to us and tell us what the conditions were. And so it's really important to understand, I think, the prehistory. Uh, yes. Um, in terms of the pikas in the Columbia River Gorge, has anybody looked into whether those cave burrows that they're living in provide a colder microhabitat that lets them regulate their body temperatures and prevent them from getting too hot? Um, and that would be the question one would um, get. It's a good question from a non-game biologist from Montana, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Thank you, Christy. Um, good question. Um, People have just started getting into that and trying to measure the temperatures. And so there was a recent paper last year that described the bioclimatic envelope of those pikas and how extreme it is. And they haven't yet started 
to look at those questions about thermal biology. And I think that they are because they're just, you know, I mean, it's just waiting to be done. So, yeah, good question, no answer. Yes. I'm going to start on answers. He's going to give me an easy question. So, as we walk into the future, we're going to see more vulnerable and in endangered species, especially with climate change. And right now, we don't even have enough room on the Endangered Species Act for wolverines or sagegrass. How do we prioritize what species we're going to put on there? Like, should, is it okay to let the polar bear go because there's nothing we can do? Or should we put our money into, say, mountain goats that have habitat? So the question, the question um, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty is how, we, how do we prioritize the kinds of organisms that we want to protect if funds are limited? And of course, they're always limited. You know, what kind of a triage system do we use? Um, I guess the answer I'm going to give, rather than saying I can't give an answer, the answer that I will give is human construct, we have choices. Um, if the goal is biological diversity, which is a huge can of worms because it can be defined from genes to ecosystems and processes, but if the goal is to maximize and retain species, you try to do it all. If the goal is to do that but you can't save them all, then maybe you pick the species that play the largest role in terms of interactions, a keystone species. And so if you remove a species and it affects a lot of other species, maybe that's the one that you want to put your effort into. Uh, let's go, yes. Do you call a, a polar bear or a snow leopard uh, the ones high up on the chain, keystone species, because the uh, trickle down scavengers and things like that? Okay. Um, question is, um, would, would biologists call polar bear, snow leopard, a keystone? Um, that's a hard question. It depends how many other organisms they affect. So snow leopards, just to address both of those, snow leopards are specialist predators, and they just have very targeted prey. So maybe not. Polar bears, because they influence seals, and because seals influence um, have a variety of species underneath them which they consume. Polar bears might be. I mean, there, there are different issues and if we just pick the predators, there are a lot of other forces that drive nature and it's just not nature, tooth and claw. But there are lots of, you know, currents, warming, ocean currents, uh, zooplankton, a lot of other things go into it. So. Um, Predators have the unusual capacity to capture the public imagination. They're icons. And so whereas maybe 50 years ago, not that many people cared about predators, predators carry a message forward. Yes? As the sea ice melts, that's going to open up a pretty big fishery. Is there any conservation plan in works for that? Yeah, so great question, great question. And I think there are probably people in the audience who can do better, but I'll take a quick stab. Um, so uh, about a year and a half ago, the Obama administration put everything from the Chukchi Sea north in the U.S. waters on hold. So the Bering, Bering Sea, um, help me with you know, one of those Fox channels, and there's like a movie, uh, TV show, Truckers. Isn't there one for fishing? Come on, Alaskan fishermen? What's it called? Who wants to reveal that? Thank you, most dangerous catch. Okay, so that's the Bering Sea. So that's the Bering Sea. Everything north of that has been put on hold to try to get a better handle on that. But um, you know, there's a lot of geopolitics going on now with Russia and Canada and Norway and uh, Finland trying to figure out this and what's open and what's not. But yes, fisheries management, huge, huge political economic issue. Uh, the Admiral, I don't know. It seems like a little bit of contradictory between two of your statements. First, you were talking about long-term versus short-term and where we're trying to go, which one we need, we need to do short-term and um, take the long-term. But also, you were talking about um, habitat, availability, habitat availability that's becoming uh, more available for mountain goats as I see. But in the short term, it seems like, yes, that's a benefit for northern populations. 
for the long term as we see climate change, we may be losing our low, our southern population that your research hasn't exactly focused on. I mean, so it seems like there's a trade off there, but for, from the northern perspective, that, that seems like a great thing, but from an overall historical perspective, it doesn't seem like quite as great of an achievement. Um, great points. Really, really important points. Um, the biology can help us understand these systems, but we make the decisions about what to conserve. Um, I'll toss this back a little bit. Jaguars. Jaguars are not being pinched by climate change, but there's a central issue in response to your question that deals with jaguars. Jaguars get into Arizona a little bit. They get into New Mexico a little bit. That's in the US. We're good Americans. We want to protect our species. How much effort should we put into jaguars at the tip of their range when jaguars go all the way down into Argentina and every country in between? And so the issue becomes, how do we, uh, much like what you were suggesting, Wes, in terms of how do we structure our priorities? You're right, in the mainland US, we're going to lose some things. There may be benefits at the north. I don't have a good answer as to how we balance that. When I think about the short versus the long term, thinking about the climate um, issues that are coming, of course we all have to think about that. I made the comment, we also need to think about the short term. We need to think about connectivity and roads and subdivisions and things in our backyard or further adrift. Um, we can't do it all. But somehow, if this stuff is important, we have to figure that out. Yes? Yeah, Joe, I just wondered if you might want to comment on the uh, concept of tipping points. Right now, there are things that people can do to, uh, you know, to change the concentration of greenhouse gases. But as soon as um, tipping points are reached, like uh, uh, melting the permafrost or warming the ocean, that those become self-perpetuating cycles. And, and, and so maybe the time for action is even shorter than uh, might, might be predicted. Yeah. Um, you make a really good point, and that would suggest a sense of urgency. And that urgency is there. And if we continue with business as usual and try and, and <coughs> continual fighting and never being able to reduce our emissions to levels that we've tried to target, we're just going to continue. I mean, I, I almost feel like this is Washington with rhetoric. Um, and I know I'm preaching to at least a sympathetic audience that aren't throwing uh, tomatoes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. And you know, doing things now is important. It is. I'm not sure how you get the message. I mean, and that's why I was talking about the social scientists, sciences and talking about outreach, talking about media, talking about secondary school educators. The more we do to get it out is good, but we need action. But we're not going to get to the action unless the message is heard and heard by a lot more people than a public like you guys. And so the real battles are in rural places where people may have more economic hardships, although in cities we certainly have that too. But figuring out ways to communicate it probably is, I would say, much more important than a lot of the science that we do. Now, I'm not saying the science, we shouldn't do the science. People like probably a number of you in the audience. I mean, if science drives you and it can motivate and it's a good thing, do it, you should. But I don't think that the battles are science. I think that the battles are education and action. Yes? Do you think that assisted migration could be beneficial or detrimental in terms of uh, species interaction for uh, conservation? Um, so the question is, do I think assisted migration, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, assisted migration could be useful for, uh, to benefit species and conservation. Um, so assisted migration is where we, humans, pick up species where they're in areas that they may be vulnerable to extirpation or massive losses because of changing conditions, and move them to more suitable places. And so I had this conversation once with Sterling Miller, who talked about um, tipping points, and thinking about picas. And so 
pikas are getting toasted in some parts of Nevada. And so what would be wrong if we took pikas and put them out on some of the isolated buttes in central Montana where they've never occurred as an experiment? Some people say there'd be nothing wrong with that. That's a good idea. Do it. But then others say, when do we start? When do we stop? How much tinkering with nature do we do? Well, of course, we tinker with nature all the time. So maybe it's OK. But it's very controversial. And the most controversial part of that, I think, is been the idea that we may inadvertently bring disease. But of course, we've done that with wolves, not with disease, but moving wolves and moving lots of animals. And we screen. So it can be done. The reticence has been, we don't know as much about the ecological interactions when we bring species X into an area where it hasn't been. Even if the habitat looks right, maybe something else is going to go wrong. And so that's been some of the reticence. But let me say that we've been moving species. Fish and game departments have been doing this. Oh, Christy could probably help me. But I want to say 70 years or more, we've been moving species around. Uh, another, any more questions? Yes. So if we reach uh, one of the tipping points and we have sort of self-perpetuating uh, loss of biodiversity, what does that mean for the world that we live in or for us? So maybe the best examples are when we start to look at the fisheries industries. And we can look at it in the Atlantic. We can look at it in the Pacific. We can look at it down by New Zealand. And you look at over harvest. And you look at the size of fish. And then you look at how we fish down the food web. Oh, well, we've lost these. Well, we're going to go to these. And so as we start to change ecosystems, a lot of the species that we depend on may not be there. And it's just going to force more and more and more opportunities in a direction that we're going to continue to fall out of control. You know, I, I mean, we can't save everything, of course. We have, what do we have, 7 billion people? How many people on the planet now? Um, the issues are challenging, yes. Um, losing biodiversity, we continue to lose biodiversity. Um, I mean, LA Basin works fine. There's very little biodiversity. How many people did I offend? Um, uh, New York City. I mean, we can pick places and go places, 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 and they seem to be working until you hit some threshold, like what Sterling was talking about, and then things get really bad. And we continue to see this as we go further and further into other areas. You know, you think of coastal highways, you think about, um, you think about pushing where we live. I mean, Tibetan Plateau, people continue to push higher and higher. So you now have villages or summer camps at 17,000 feet. And so we are erasing a lot of the animals that live in those systems. Do those systems collapse? No, but ultimately what's happening to them is also bringing back problems for us. Okay, um, at the end of your um, presentation, you mentioned the, you mentioned like rhinos, and I read a book about um, the legal trade in rhino horn and a bunch of Chinese um, medicine manufacturers stockpiling um, like um, like cups and stuff and been made out of rhino horn because they know they're going extinct. And I was just wondering, say, because I knew you work on it directly. What is the thoughts behind that in the Chinese culture? I mean, do they not foresee that eventually they're going to run out of the things they're stockpiling and their Chinese medicine, the entire thing is built on, is going to collapse because they don't have it anymore? So I'm going to try to give, um, I will answer that if there's a Chinese, bi is Li Xu here? Li Xu. So we have a biologist here from China who's worked on illegal trade. Um, Li Xu, she asked, "What could you hear the question? Um, do you want? Uh, can you ask it shorter, and she yeah. will answer." Um, as far as the trade and illegal uh, rhino horn goes, and the fact that Chinese medicine is built on it, and they know that they are going extinct. I mean, I just think it's weird that they aren't doing anything to conserve conserve rhinos, even as you know, a cultural heritage because they run out of rhino horn, the traditional Chinese medicine kind of collapses. 
So what are, I don't know, I'm just kind of wondering about that. And actually since 1993, it's illegal to trade any rhino products within China. That was banned by the highest court in China. And, um, but there are continual illegal trade. And another thing is, uh, we don't, we have no more rhino in China. But I mean, um, I don't know, the book I read talked about, you know, just Chinese medicine, like, be still being manufactured in China. I don't know if it was the book that was, um, it was incorrect. Nowadays, as I, I know, there is no like legally made medicine in China from rhino. But there are a lot of illegal use because you can just use it as powder um, by person without any prescription. Okay. So I think what I'll do is I'm just going to try to wrap this up a little bit and just um, make the point that. Um, just as our government does much as we sign CITES convention and legislation to police and to do things, we still have uh, poaching of gallbladders here for black bears and paws and things, despite the fact that, you know, at a government level, we do our best, and at a state level, we do our best. In China, rhino horn has, um, as Li Xu had said, it's been illegal for 17 years. So let me just say, um, Thanks. You guys have been a very attentive audience. I've appreciated. No cell phones have gone off. And Nikki, do you have a last thought? No, but thanks for coming. Okay. Thanks. Okay.